thanks again for joining us, everyone. I think we're just about ready to get started as uh, some more people enter from the waiting room. So great to see um, such a nice group of folks interested in research in schools. We really appreciate your uh, interest in this and your participation in our uh, session this afternoon. See there are just a couple more people entering from the waiting room. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Leslie Babinski, and I'm the director of the School Research Partnership, which is sponsoring this event, along with the Center for Child and Family Policy and the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. And today's session, as you know, is about conducting research in schools. Uh, we all know it's been a really difficult few years, especially for schools and children and teachers. And we're honored to have four school leaders with us today from their district's Office of Research, along with Duke's IRB director. And now that schools are back in person and many researchers are being permitted to enter schools again, um, I know that there are researchers interested in partnering with school districts for their projects and their research. So in our panel presentations today, you're gonna hear a little bit about each school system, their strategic priorities, their process for requesting approval to conduct research, and a couple of tips about important things to consider when you're planning to submit an application to conduct research. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. First up, we have Holly Williams, who's the Director of the Campus Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, at Duke University. Welcome, Holly. Uh, next, I'd like Thank to you. introduce Dr. Albert Royster, the Executive Director of Research and Accountability in Durham Public Schools. Welcome. Good afternoon. Next is Dr. Sherry Johnson, Director of Research and Grant Development for the Johnston County Schools. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, next, we have Dr. Diane Vilwalk, the Executive Director of Assessment and Research for the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. Welcome. Good afternoon. And then finally, we have Dr. Colleen Paplow. She's the Senior Director of Program Accountability for the Wake County Public School System. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, well, thank you all to the panelists for joining us today. Um, each panelist will first give a brief overview of their district, um, and then we'll open it up for discussion with our participants. So please submit your questions to the Q&A at any time, and I'll be compiling them and looking them over to try to um, find some general questions to ask our panelists at the end of the presentation. We'll have time for a discussion. So first up, I'd like to welcome Holly Williams, who will talk about things to consider when um, submitting your IRB for school-based research. Thanks, Leslie. Um, to anybody who hasn't interacted with the Canvas IRB before, um, I want to emphasize that we really um, want to have a conversation with you as early as possible in the development of your projects. And one of the first things we do in that conversation, whether that's, of course, face to face is harder to do now, but we can do it via email or phone. Um, is can I have the next slide, please, is um, to figure out whether or not you even need to be interacting with the IRB. And so the first question is, is your project research? And that determination is based on your intent. And if your intent is to um, develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge or to add to a larger body of information, then your intent is research. And so if the answer to the research question is yes, then the next question is, next slide, is does your research involve human subjects? And for that, we're gonna wanna know, are you gathering information about whom? Um, private identifiable information about living individuals? Or are you simply using humans as a conduit for information for about what? Um, so, um, your human subjects are going to be sharing with you their personal thoughts, their impressions, information about them, or are they going to be sharing information from a website or um, annual report or something to that effect, in which case it's about what 
and we would not need to review your protocol because your project would not involve um, human subjects. And to talk a little bit more about the private information piece, um, private information, according to the um, federal regulations, is information that occurs in a context where a person could reasonably expect that that would be private, or information that's provided to someone in the context where the individual would expect privacy, say with your counselor, your clergy, your doctor, your spouse, your friends. Um, that's what we think of in terms of private information. So, or if you're accessing information about living humans that already exists. So if you're gonna be analyzing a database of information about living humans, then that would be subject to IRB review as well. And so, um, again, we want to determine in a, a, as early as possible in a conversation with you, whether um, you even need to be interacting with the IRB. And so if you're doing research with the intent of contributing to generalizable knowledge, and you're gonna involve living humans, then you do need to interact with the IRB. And from there, during that conversation, we'll help you anticipate the level of review that your project is likely to need. And also too, with research in the schools, it's important to note that oftentimes, the school will want you to establish approval with your with the IRB first and the IRB, on the other hand, is also very um, it's a very important that the IRB uh, defer to the schools as much as possible because the school understands the setting understands the logistics understands what's feasible within that setting and so this might sound like a chicken or egg kind of dilemma but the IRB is if, if your school wants you to secure IRB approval first we can do that we call it conditional approval so that what you present to the IRB we can determine meets the requirements of the regulations and Duke policy, but then you take your protocol to the school and the school says, well, this all looks fine, but you're gonna have to tweak this, this, or this. So the conditional approval means the IRB has tentatively said, this looks like it'll work, but the expectation is after it's been reviewed by the schools that you'll bring the protocol back to the IRB and be prepared to ask for changes based on the school's feedback from their review. So you want to build in that time in, in your timeline to allow a little bit of back and forth to allow this, the IRB to approve it. And then the schools or sometimes the school will approve it first and then the IRB has a look at it. So you kind of got to adjust your timeline according to what the school wants you to do. And I'll be available after the call to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, that was a great uh, quick overview and uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. And I know there's a whole lot more you could say about the IRB process and um, I appreciate you opening it up for people to contact you to ask more questions. Uh, so next up, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Albert Royster from the Durham Public Schools who will be talking about um, his district. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to just go over a little bit about Durham Public Schools, our Office of Research and Accountability, and kind of conducting research in DPS schools. Uh, I am new to the role. I was recently um, hired as the executive director in July uh, 25th of this year, but also I worked previously in Durham Public Schools as the director of student services. So I just kind of switched over departments. Uh, next slide, please. So we have, I just want to kind of give our, our Durham Public Schools strategic uh, plan at a glance. We're actually sunsetting on our strategic plan as it ends this school year 2022-2023. And so we have five priorities that stakeholders from the community uh, came together to uh, kind of come together to create. And priority one is increased academic achievement. Um, our priority two wants to provide a safe school environment that supports the whole child. Our priority three is attract and uh, attain, retain outstanding educators and staff. Priority four is strengthen school, family, and community engagement. And priority five is ensure physical and operational, operational uh, responsibility. 
Next slide, please. And kind of based on those strategic plan goals, um, Dr. Mabanga, our superintendent, has kind of uh, charged our school leaders with uh, some non-negotiables going forward. And so as you can see, we have pretty much six non-negotiables um, that we that that our school leaders are kind of charged to uh, charged to carry out every day, and that's established realistic goals driven by data at the school um, school teacher and uh, student levels with frequent monitoring, uh, standardized professional learning communities, um, meeting once once a week or once a month, I should say, with checks for effectiveness, creating intervention plans um, at the beginning of the academic school year for elementary schools and the beginning of the semester for secondary schools. Um, with that monitoring piece, um, developing a comprehensive professional development plan at the beginning of the year for their school, um, and then kind of evidence of follow-ups of evaluations, um, envisioning design, innovative and rewarding incentive plans, and then engaging families. And the reason why I put those five non-negotiables up there, as you can see, our school principals have a lot on them because our, our main responsibility is educating and, and our students and providing the best uh, instruction that they can have every day. Next slide, please. Just a little bit uh, of kind of our student enrollment for 2021-2022. We were at 31,113 uh, students. Uh, this year, our end of our month one PMR, we were at 31,124. Um, we do have 55 schools, 30 elementary, um, nine middle schools, one K through eight school. We have two secondary schools that are six through 12. We have 10 high schools that are comprehensive. We do have an alternative school, a hospital school, and then we have one virtual academy school. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just kind of our student enrollment, kind of our demographic makeup. As you can see, American Indian, we're 0.2%. Uh, um, Asian, we're at 1.9%. Um, black and Hispanic, that's, um, we, we do have a, a, a district that's a majority black and brown kids. And as you see, our, our, our black student population is 39.8%. Hispanic is 34.2%. Pacific Islander is 0.1%. White is 19.1%. And two or more races is 4.8%. Next slide, please. And so what I wanted to do is just the reason why I brought up those non-negotiables is, and I mentioned that our principals have a lot on them every day, is that um, the number one goal for as as an executive director for research and accountability is that we get a lot of research projects and submissions and proposals a lot of times. And so what I want to do is make sure I protect students, staff, and principals. First of all, protect them as as participants if they are involved in any research projects, and then also uh, protect that instructional time. So again, our number one priority is to make sure our kids are educated. And so with our principals having a lot on them, we wanna make sure that they are able to carry out that and, and not have interruptions um, in their instructional time with different activities. We ask our principals and our staff to do a lot. They're not only educators, but their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their grandmothers, their caretakers, they have a lot on them. And so what we wanna do is protect that time and make sure we're protecting our students. And so. Three links that we have or three things that I invite you to do is one thing for Durham Public Schools um, research website. It has everything that you can think of in terms of our, our cycles with our dates on when you can submit research proposals, or research project proposals. It has the fees. It has everything that you can think of. So that is a one stop shop um, for information about Durham Public Schools for our research. Um, also, in that site, which I definitely want you to, to pay attention to, is we have a research process and FAQs. And so within that website, there'll be at the end, there'll be a Word document that'll have everything that you can think of, what, what kind of research projects might be approved, what might not be approved, um, the processes you need to go through. Um, any kind of question, FAQ that we can think of is there. And then also I put there to the DPS research application. So again, you have to submit that research application. And so that'll give you kind of a preview of what kind of things we're asking for when you submit your application. And so those are probably the, the, the best th three items and probably sources of information that you can see. But again, the, the, the website that tells you all the information, the FAQs, and then actually what the application um, consists of. Um, as I'm closing up, I would uh, like to say that I do have, um, I'm sorry, thank you for next slide. 
Um, this is my contact information, but I do invite you because we get a lot of inquiries to, to contact my administrative assistant, Ms. Mo Meredith Mooney, and her phone number and extension is there along with her email. Um, and so she is the kind of front line. She kind of filters and helps me because I, I am not just over research. I am also over testing and accountability as, as well as data integration. So power school, I'm, I'm over, my department handles all of that. So she helps filter those research projects. So I'll end there. Thank you so much, Dr. Royster. That was a terrific overview and we appreciate the resources for how to learn more. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Cherry Johnson from the Johnston County Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share. Um, we, we always enjoy the partnerships that we have. Um, our district is one of the big tens. You'll see that on the next slide, please. And we have in excess of 37,000 students. Um, also, we're the largest employer in our county with 5,000 employees. Um, we traditionally were not very diverse, but that has changed somewhat. Um, so we now have the most diversity we've ever had, and the white population of students has dropped 50%. Um, so we're not as diverse as some districts, but we are getting there, and we certainly want to make sure that we are giving um, equal opportunities. So that's that's an area that you might want to consider for research as well. Next slide, please. We have mostly traditional schools. However, we do have some special programs. So whether you're interested in research at the um, elementary, middle, or high level, K-12, or if you're interested in a more specialized environment, there should be an opportunity that we could work out for you. Um, we do not have year round, so we are we are not um, in that position quite yet, like some of the other surrounding counties. We are on on um, somewhat of a traditional calendar, just so you'll be aware of, of timing. All of our schools are on traditional calendars, except for the two that are located on the community college campus. So our early college and our CTLA, which is our Career and Technical Leadership Academy, um, run on the college schedule. Next slide, please. Um, we do have a research protocol and application. They are rolled together and we've included a link here that you can follow or you can simply go to the website um, we ask that you at, allow about a 90-day timeline to make sure that, um, as Holly put it, that there is some time for some back and forth if that needs to be. Um, it often does not take that long, but it's best to allow that. And it's also best if you go ahead and have a really solid um idea of what you're going to do and what you're going to ask because you need to include some of those things to help us evaluate. Um, it does ask for IRB approval. However, um, we're willing to work with you just as Holly is willing to work with you at her end to um, ensure that it works to your benefit. So if you say your IRB is, a pen is pending, that's fine with us. We just want the final um, when when you come back to us. Next slide, please. I included some things that um, work well and don't work well. Um, I tried to, to phrase them positively. Um, if you can be very specific in your application, that helps me when I go to district leadership um, to advocate for your project. Also, make sure that your application does include everything that it needs, um, particularly a full list of questions or any instruments that you plan to use, um, because that's one of the first questions um, district leadership asks of me if I take a project and ask for support. And also, um, from my end, please be prepared to discuss the value of your research for our district. Um, that actually helps me advocate for you 
um, I, I point out why we might need the report you're presenting or how that's going to encourage our students to go into a particular career or how that's going to help us improve our teaching strategies. Um, and so I treat it, um, since I do grants as well, both cash and in-kind, I treat it almost as an in-kind grant. And I can advocate for you by saying, hey, look at the value that they are going to add if we allow them to come and, and partner with us. Um, so that helps me help you. Um, please be um, very careful with sensitive and personal student questions. Um, that is the first red flag that um, causes district leadership to shoot things down when I, when I um, speak to them. And, and quite honestly, sometimes causes me to um, have pause and think it's not a good idea um, to, to put the fo project forward. And also uh, be mindful of staff time commitments. That's the number two thing. Um, here are some specific examples. Um, from this academic year, we had someone who wanted to conduct uh, research and um, wanted to ask some very um, personal sexual orientation questions of students. And that was not something that goes over well with the parents in this particular county, and it did not go over well with district leadership, and that was denied. Um, something that did work well because the person was mindful of time um, was a, a, a researcher who is looking at how well alternative teacher preparation programs prepare our lateral entry people and the, what kind of supports that they get that will help keep them in teaching. And she is using a very short 20-minute survey that's on a voluntary basis. And then she is then using um, following that, some one-on-one -on -one interviews for about 20 minutes, and that's also on a voluntary basis. And so it's very mindful that no one is forced, and it's very mindful that the time periods are short. Again, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing from some of you and working with you in the future. Thank you so much. Dr. Johnston, that was a really good overview, some nice advice for our researchers, and I appreciate those examples um, about uh, how uh, researchers can partner with your district. So that was really good. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Diane Vilwalk from the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. He's going to talk with us about doing research in that district. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Oh, I can't, I'm trying to make this move forward. Next slide, please. So um, I seem to be the smallest district in the group. Um, our enrollment um, in the 1920 school year, so just before COVID, was at 12,581. Um, we have dropped down to 11,700 for the current year. That's a drop of about seven percentage points. As we ask people where they're going, most of them are just moving away. They're moving to other towns or states or um, out of the country. Um, the proportions of um, students of color, Black, Latinx, and multiracial have been going up slowly but steadily over this time period. At the same time, we're seeing Asian and white student um, populations declining. Um, and we found that even though the overall enrollment was down by 7%, um, overall, the percentage of our multilingual learners grew at a level of about 7%, and our students with disabilities was falling backwards. Um, I don't know if we're sharing these slides, but there's a link up above there where you can look at some more details about the shift. I didn't include the number of schools, but um, we have 11 elementary, four middles, um, three comprehensive high schools, an alternative high school, and a virtual high school. We also do work with UNC Hospital with a hospital school. Next slide. We have a brand new strategic plan. We're off cycle from Durham. We just got this one fresh off the presses. 
Um, and you can see there on your screen that our strategic priorities look a whole lot like Durham's. Um, we're working on a culture of safety and wellness, and that's for everyone in the district. Um, instructional excellence, um, empowering, equipping, investing in people, equitable and transparent fiscal stewardship, and then strengthening family and community engagement. There's a pretty big focus on wellness in our district. That's one of our core values. Um, and you'll see if you're interested in SEL things that there's some SEL data being collected. Um, this superintendent is very into um, whole people as well as whole children. So, you know, this has been a, a refreshing um, shift in leadership. Next slide. So I have a more relaxed um, process for requesting research, partly because I'm so much smaller. Um, so all one has to do is to send me an email with a copy of the fine, I say final IRB packet, I'm with Holly. If you have provisional agreement, I'm happy to look at that. Um, I do want evidence of some approval from your university and then a brief discussion of what do you want from us. Um, and it helps not infrequently for me to talk to you. Um, and so it kind of depends on what the situation is. Uh, if you're interested in starting to develop partnerships with the district, that might be time to come on in for a few minutes and let's have a cup of coffee and talk through how you think about research and what you're interested in. Um, but I will say on the flip side that COVID has greatly reduced the number of projects we have approved. Um, if you go to the next slide, so this is a really important context to set, and I'm really sure that this is true for all districts. Um, we continue to be understaffed, and we're understaffed in lots of places. I talked to a principal this afternoon who doesn't have someone called um, a PF, it's a program facilitator, who works with um, exceptional children and setting up the IEP plans and that sort of thing. He hasn't had one of those people in over a year. And then he told me that like four of the schools don't have one of those. And so for every one of those people who's missing, that work lands on somebody else. It's often the principal, but it can be anybody. We have teachers taking, you know, giving up planning periods to take an extra period to teach so that we have coverage for our classes. So I want to say that in general, staff members are worn out from the COVID years in general and the losses they may have gone through and just the stress and strain we all went through. But there's also this very pressing ongoing need for extra work that I think is weighing folks down. And so we're seeing um, a higher amount of um, resignations um, and we're finding it harder to fill positions. And so that's just the space we live in right now. Um, and so um, I would agree that we want to consider ways to do research that are low impact um, on the schools and the staff. Um, and so I liked Cherry's idea about something where it's very voluntary and it's done outside of school hours and it's short. Um, or it's using existing data and asking some interesting questions out of archival data um, that might be useful um, rather than trying to come in and you know, teach us all a new curriculum or something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. That was really great, especially reminding us about the context and what's going on with COVID and the recovery from that. So that's really important for all of our researchers to consider. Next up, I'd like to introduce our final panelist for today, Dr. Colleen Paplow from the Wake County Public School System. Welcome. Hi, I'm happy to be here. So um, as um, Leslie's um, bringing up slides, I just want to um, introduce myself. So I'm Colleen Paplow and I've been in uh, data research and accountability for about 20 years in Wake County. And I have the pleasure of sitting on the research review committee. Um, so I'm, I'm a co-chair on that committee. So uh, I, I'm here to share how we engage with researchers in White County. But before I get started, if you switch to the next slide, I'll just introduce the context of our district. 
Um, we are a very large school district with um, approximately 159,000 students, nearly 200 schools. Um, and in the 20 years I've been within White County, I just see that number checking, growing every, <laughs> almost every year. And so I always have to look because it just keeps going up. Um, I will say we have, we are also, I think Wake County Public Schools is the number one employer in Wake. Um, and we have 20,000 or over 20,000 employees, uh, about 11,000 of those are teachers. So the balance are not just central services, but you know, custodians and cafeteria workers and everybody that it takes to run our schools. Um, we have a highly educated workforce. Our teachers, um, over a third of them have advanced degrees and we have over 1500 nationally board certified teachers. Um, for our, um, in terms of our special programmed kids, we have uh, about 25% free and reduced lunch, 9% uh, limited English proficiency and approximately 12% special education. Now, I didn't put in our um, ethnic breakout, but I will quickly just tell you, scribbling this as my colleagues um, remembered to share that and I didn't. Uh, <laughs> we are a diverse school district and we are now a minority majority. So we don't, we know, I think um, it's approximately 40% um, uh, uh, white students and then about 20% African-American and just shy of that for Hispanic. And our Hispanic population is a population that is growing. Now we do, um, uh, like Chapel Hill, Cabo, we're getting new strategic plan framework that's just kind of fresh out of the box. Um, it's just being socialized right now. And our district priorities are very similar to my colleagues. I was smiling as you guys <laughs> read yours because they are very, very close. So we have the our academic under student knowledge and skills. We have our wellness and well-being under the student dispositions and well-being and we have our fiscal responsibility and operations under operational effectiveness and supporting those strategic priorities we have essential pillars which include the high quality instructional core for all content areas as well as equity focused practices high quality uh, staff and then um, that family and community engagement piece that we saw in the other school districts as well. Now, how we engage our, um, our partner with researchers, if you go to the next slide, um, we do that primarily in four ways. Um, external research, um, the research review committee that sits inside data research and accountability, um, we meet once a month to review um, applications uh, and it varies by um, semester, as you can imagine how many we get, but we, we uh, we usually receive approximately 100 requests a year. Um, and so we have a team that goes through these every month and um, faculty, graduate students, other, as other research organizations um, will come in and conduct research. Um, this, it, for external researchers, we uh, grant approval for studies that are of high interest to the district and that we feel that would benefit us. Um, we used to say, do no harm. Now we say, do some good. So what, what will um, be the benefit for our district? And um, similar to what my colleagues have said, making sure that applications filled out will help um, increase your likelihood of being um, uh, accepted and approved. Uh, okay, the next slide. We also partner with uh, researchers. So again, same folks, um, maybe faculty and organizations most often. Uh, will operate as partners with us. And in this case, we are actually in the work with you. So it could be um, that you partner right now, we have a partnership with uh, NC State and um, our equity office uh, so that they can have meetings and I, I'll help usher, you know, kind of meet, meet with them and be a conduit for some of the research needs um, to help strengthen that partnership. Another way in which we um, engage with research, um, if you advance the next slide, is through action research. And this is our employees uh, doing graduate coursework that they need to conduct original research. And with their, in this case, it's a teacher, with their students, it could also be central service folks, as long as it's done within the confines of their position so that they're using that information to advance 
and improve their job and the work that they do for Wake County, that would be considered action research. And then lastly, um, we have an internship program. So this is my shameless plug for interns. <laughs> um, it's an embedded internship program and um, students come for a semester and they support a research project. And this is done at a professional level. So you're operating as a senior administrator. Um, and we usually slice these, um, either it's a full project or a slice where you're doing everything from data collection to writing. And um, unfortunately we do not offer a paid internship. Uh, we do work with universities to offer course credit. And many of my contractors come from former interns. Um, and we've even hired former interns, <laughs> just my shameless fun. Okay, so um, for hints and tips, I want to just say ditto, ditto, ditto on all my colleagues and what they've shared because um, yes, uh, staff time is, is paramount. We have to be mindful that our staff are overtaxed and worse than ever with um, staffing shortages, uh, making sure in, we protect student instructional time um, avoiding sensitive questions, making sure you're not asking for things that we, we just can't give permission. We had one study asked to give vitamins to our kids and we just, we can't approve that. So um, even if I believe in vitamins, I take them myself, but we can't approve that in the district. Um, parents would not find us um, doing that very helpful. Um, complete thorough filling out the applications is important. The more information you can provide, the better making sure that uh, you include your instruments so that we can see what you plan on asking um, and making sure it's of high value to the district and how we can use that information. Um, I didn't put a link to our website, but that was not um, because I don't want you to find us. It's because it's so super easy to find us. Um, you can literally Google WCPSS um, research partner and it'll come up or just go in our onto our website and research partnerships and they and you'll see um, how to conduct research um, will be a link right there. And all the information that you need, including what I've shared today and much more detail, as well as um, the application. And we again, we meet once a month and um, it's usually the end of month. So we ask for a couple of days before the end of the month, if you can get it to us because um, our staff need to review it before we meet uh, and that will speed you up and you won't have to wait till the next month for review. All right, thank you so much for that overview of uh, research in the Wake County Public School System. I'm happy to say that my current uh, project is in eight elementary schools in Wake County, and um, you all have been such really amazing partners for us. So I really appreciate that. So thank you to all of our panelists. I'd like to bring everyone up now and uh, open it up for questions uh, from our participants. So if you have a question for our panelists, go ahead and um, write it into the chat and uh, we'll be sure to get to that. Um, one thing though, I wanna ask all of you, I wanna follow up on uh, what Colleen just said about um, projects that are high value to the district and partnering with researchers. How does somebody get started with that? Like how would a researcher know if it was high value to you? Um, and this is for anyone. What would you recommend that um, a researcher do to initiate a partnership with a school district? Who wants to go first? I, I can, I, I think with any district, um, um, they should be doing what Al talked about, um, looking at the district improvement plan and seeing what the current goals are. Because if you have alignment there um, in any district across the nation, that should make um, a partnership more valuable and easier to accomplish. Yeah, and I would, I would follow up. Thank you, uh, Sherry, for that. I would follow up too and say, um, Having a, and I think a lot of my colleagues have said this, having conversations as well too. So reaching out um, and reaching out and um, seeing and talking to. So for example, with me, um, if if you wanted wanted to um, have a partnership and it was dealing with curriculum and instruction, then I would probably reach out to my director or executive director in curriculum and instruction, and then have a conversation with them. 
Um, and then if it's appropriate, then pair that director with the researcher to get or all three of us to talk. So it depends on what area it's in, is having that conversation first to see, as you mentioned, if it aligns and if it does, if it's a specific department within the school district, then having an expert in that department then weighing in because they might see aspects of the research project that I might not see and vice versa. So that's what I would say as well. Yeah, ditto what I just said. <laughs> Pretty much I'm the conduit. Um, it's best to start with me. I know who does what. Um, and I'll do the same exact process. I'll check with my colleagues, see if they've got bandwidth to focus on it and they have interest in the topic. Um, and then we move from there. We have partnerships that I literally have done at this point for 28 years. Um, they, they come back and do the next iteration of the study and you know they're dear friends at this point. So. All right, thank you so much. That's fantastic. And we really do value those partnerships with you all. And I really appreciate your dedication to um, helping our researchers find the right contact person at the district so that we know that the questions that we're asking are appropriate and are valued by the school district and um, will make a difference. So uh, that partnership is, is so important to all of us. Um, we have a question about requesting letters of support. As you all know, much of our research is funded externally and many of the funding agencies will require that we have a partner in the schools prior to even having a project, you know, well in advance of being funded. Um, I'd like to ask maybe each of you to speak to uh, the process that you have in place for a researcher who doesn't have funding yet, but is applying and would like to get a letter of support. Well, I, I guess I'll I'll go first again. Um, I handle that carefully um, now that we have an official protocol in place. However, I understand difficulty of of the chicken and egg conundrum. And so as long as we have an out and we don't have a commitment, I will write a letter of support to try to help you get the grant so that you can then apply or even know that, that an application is feasible. Um, I just can't make a definite commitment, but I, I do understand the difficulty that researchers face. Um, Every time someone says, can you help me out with this? You know, I, I think about um, a few challenges I faced even as a doctoral student in my own district at that time. And I was there, you know, I was in the trenches every day. And so I don't want anyone to be in that position. And so as long as you'll leave me an out, um, I will I will help you out with a letter of support. Thank you. And we'll we probably, will do we will do something similar to um, the you know just a regular um, a, approval process. We will reach out to those content folks, and if they're if that's something like if the grants approved, they would be excited for that professional learning or whatever is in, embedded in that grant. Then we could um, possibly give that um, letter of support again, provided that we have you know some writing in there that says as long, you know as long as it's we have the capacity at the point when that grant is approved, um, they have approved, you know, they, then they're welcome to come do research. So it's kind of a, like Sherry said, leaving a little bit of wiggle room um, because context might change. Yeah, I agree. So um, it's not a dissimilar process. I would go and talk to the other colleagues who were related to the project and see if they have interest um, I will say that context does change. And so there's one that comes to mind and the researcher was pretty annoyed with me when I said, I'm sorry, we can't do it. It's a different superintendent, completely different leadership. And I just said, this leadership has no interest in this and I, there's nothing I can do. Um, I turned one down this year that sounded fabulous, but they wanted to work in a block of time that doesn't exist in our elementary schools. And so they wanted to do an SEL project. We'd have been all over it, but they wanted this block of time. We changed those schedules and those schedules are tight. 
And so there is no block of open time to do a research project during the day with kids. It just doesn't exist. So um, anyway, I think it's a very similar process. Um, obviously, you're not giving us an I or B, but you're giving us enough of a description of the project that we can see what it is you're asking for. Yeah, I was, I'll agree. I'll concur with the rest of my colleagues um, as well, too. We have a similar process. And then I also talk to colleagues being new in my position. We also have uh, another individual that actually handles grants for us. Um, and, and so I will go confer with her and then get her opinion on the approval letter, the approval letter, excuse me, as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all very much. And thank you for the support of our grant proposals, because you know that's our first step in uh, seeing if we can get the funding for the projects. Um, we have a question, and I know this is a common question that comes up. Um, how do you all handle student research? So dissertations, master's theses, undergraduate honors theses, um, capstone projects for classes. I'll go ahead and start. Um, it's on our website. So we we do not uh, we uh, disqualify uh, undergraduate research studies as well as external masters or doctoral research studies. So the only the only thing that we accept in terms of a dissertation would be someone that works that is an employee of EPS. We don't disqualify, but um, because of time constraints. Um, the lion's share of those would also go to um, our own employees who are also students. So it's not an impossibility. And and again, I'm very much in favor of helping students. You know, we've all been in the position. Um, it's just not always feasible. And again, the the more they can make it so that you are um, getting someone, an adult, and pr particularly and and someone who um, is volunteering their time and, and keeping it small and minimal, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, we don't actually um, want to do the approval process for like anything below dissertations and master's thesis. We want something that is has an IRB attached to it. So if it's going through an IRB at a university, then that's the level that we, we'd be approving. Um, so we are we do approve studies that are external to WAKE, um, as long as they're, they meet the other criteria of being, of, um, you know, that they're gonna answer questions that are important to us, that they're not taxing our, our staff's time too much, that they're not overly sensitive. All those criteria um, would be, make them more likely to be approved in WAKE. I agree with all of that. Um, usually what I do when someone below um, masters and doctorates contact me, if it's not being published, so we're talking about your capstone for a class or a project for a course, my response is talk to the principal. If the principal is willing to play with you, go, because it's not really research in the sense that Holly talks about. And so if it doesn't come to IRB because it's not really research, then I don't weigh in on it. I basically say, if you can encourage a principal to say yes and the teachers to say yes, um, you know, sometimes they know someone in the school and they say, you know, she's my neighbor or something and she's willing to let me do it. And my response is, if your principal's up for it, I'm fine. So um, I, I agree with, Cherry, I try to be as supportive as I can be, but we've all said it, our job is to educate students and our job is not to kill off our staff. And so, you know, you have to balance where your request might fit in that space. And of course, I would say that space got a lot smaller in the last three years, right? It's just a, it's a teenier place. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you for all those responses about what that um, might look like in your district. Uh, we have another question from a participant and it says, uh, assuming that IRB has approved the study, is there a chance to recruit students to participate in work outside of school hours? Actually, um, I saw that when it popped up and um, the situation has to be just right. 
but it there is an option in certain um, circumstances. I'll, I'll give you an example. We had someone who um, was conducting a project. He had a grant project, which also included research, and he was paying stipends to teachers who were staying after school to um, tutor students who were just learning English, and they were um, using his supplemental materials, and he's actually come back and expanded on the project. So they those students would have been tutored after school anyway, so it was a win-win situation because um, he actually paid the district who paid the teachers, so that took um, the financial responsibility off of the district for a couple of tutors, and it also allowed him to um, to check out some of the materials that he wanted to test. So it turned out to be a winning project, and it was done after school, and it worked so well that they are now trying it in three schools this year during school hours. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one, Diane? Yeah. We have the opportunity for people to post flyers on a system called Peach Jar. If you go to our district website and type in flyer, I think it pops up. Again, you can just email me. Um, I vet it the way I vet research projects, but it doesn't have to go against how does this fit inside the school day and how does this impact. So it might be, you know, an adolescent study on, um, students who have eating disorders and it's somebody in the medical world who wants access to adolescent students and so these just get put out on the peach jar and then i think an email goes to parents once a week with the peach jar flyers and they can read through the flyers and pick what they want so it's sort of they used to have oh let's bring you these advertisement documents and so we use this instead so sure we're open to research and I would say you know it takes away the bar of how big is the impact on the school day because it's um, outside and we're just I've had them that had nothing to do with students that were they're looking for parents soon after a pregnancy so um, yeah we absolutely have that system and so I guess that goes to students outside school hours yes. right so that could be another one. Obviously, parent consent would be important. Yeah, and I'll just chime in. I agree with everybody else. It just depends on the, the research project and what it what it's asking. So I can't say a blanket statement and say yes, but the examples being in this role, the short time I have, the examples that everybody, my colleagues have used, um, that could be a, a possible um, approval. But again, it just depends on it, it depends on the situation. It depends on what the ask is. I'd agree. And it just goes through the same screening criteria, because I could imagine if you were asking like high school kids to jump on a Zoom to do a focus group, that would be completely possible and even preferable because it's outside of school hours. Um, so it, it'd be on a case by case basis. Thank you. That's great to hear. Um, is that also true for teachers? Can I ask, like, say, you know, I'll get um, folks who are interested in talking with teachers about a particular topic, if it were just, you know, an invitation to meet with a researcher outside of school hours, is that similar? Yes, and since everything is voluntary, like even when we approve it for the district, all our letters say that our approval can still be denied at the principal level. So we approve it at the district level and then the principal has the right to decide for their students and staff. If, um, but we, they like us to know that we looked at it and kind of vetted it and gave us, you know, approval. Um, so they, cause they trust us, but they have the right if they, for some reason, maybe there's conditions at the school that we're not aware of that they're overtaxed with, they can say no. Yeah, I would I would echo that. That's probably most one of the if, if if you hear nothing else today, I think that's an important aspect is that we can approve it or at least for Durham, Durham, and I think for a lot, we can approve it on the district level, but it is the end of the day, it is the principal's responsibility or the principal's right to go forward. We might have one principal that ideal 
conditions are ideal and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm all for this, where we might have another school where they're like, we got a lot going on right now. We can't do that. And so um, that that's very important about that, um, that, you know, willingness of the principal. And we and, and what my I think what my job is to be impartial and just present to the principal. This is what the proposal. This is what it is. This is what the ask. So I am not going to going to lobby either way. Yeah, this is great. Or no, don't. I'm giving them the information, and then I have them make their decision. As as Colleen mentioned, I we just approve it because we. It might be different. It might be different situations for different schools, but it's their ultimate, you know, position. And I don't go back and forth and say, "Are you sure?" Well, you can have two or three follow up. Even no, once they say no or they say I, I don't want to do this then I that's the answer then I'll give back to the researchers that um the principal decided not to partake in this research project so I think that's very important that just because we approve it that doesn't mean that the school are going the school is going to participate so Al sometimes that process happens before it ever gets vetted so the the researcher will go straight to the principal the principal writes me and says you got to be kidding so I write back the researcher and say, I'm terribly sorry, the principal's not interested. So, you know, sometimes that saves us all time because it's clear that you're not going to get approval. Um, I will say sometimes principals are fine when you're looking for, you know, one teacher at first grade. And we, I just say, send them an email with the invitation. There's four teachers there. If they bite, they bite. If they don't, they don't. Um, so again, the teachers, of course, or the subjects have the right to also refuse. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that. Uh, I know we're getting close to time. I'll add to that. Well, in Durham, we do have, and we can't regulate this all the time, but we do have that researchers should not contact the schools first because what we don't, and just in our case, what we have is they don't, we don't want the schools, the schools to be bombarded. So what, and I know we can't catch that all the time, but we always stress, and you see it on our website that, they should contact our office first so we can um, vet it um, because what will happen is I don't want a principal call and, and sometimes it happens and I, and, I, and I remind our principals, hey, that's good that they reached out, but they should have reached out to our office first. We're trying to protect you from getting asked 20 different research projects. So I know it might vary in our district, but I think on our website, we, we ask that they contact our office first before they contact the school so we can kind of filter that as well too. And I will say ditto. We prefer them to reach out to us so that we can filter. And there, because there, there's a lot of the hundred that we get, we're not sending them all out. So they, they, we do that pre-filter to save the principals, um, you know, even a few minutes of their time because they have a very busy schedules. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Uh, clearly, you are our point of contact in each of your districts, so it's really wonderful that you're able to join us today and uh, give us these insights and your suggestions for how to partner with you all to conduct research. I really appreciate it. Um, to our participants, please do click on the link in the chat that Erica posted for a brief feedback survey. We'd like to hear from you and we appreciate your feedback. And I'd like to also announce that uh, we have an event coming up, which is our Salzburger Distinguished Lecture on November 15th, and it's featuring Dr. Dudley Flood, former educator and champion of school integration. So please do plan to join us for that. Look for the registration link. And once again, thank you all for joining us and a special thank you to our panelists.